Oh, it's good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and especially delighted to be here with, with Freya, who was a, a, a woman that I became involved with when she was having her babies. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. And um, Freya was also a, a participant in my PhD study. And she gave me permission to use her birth stories for this presentation because it, it so illustrates the importance of getting it right first time. So Freya's here with me. Um, I, I would love her to be able to um, read her own quotes because these are her words, but we're not sure whether that's going to be possible yet because what, what you did say to me, Freya, was, I'm absolutely fine. I've moved on. Life's great. However, when we go back and talk about my birth, it's still very emotional. As it is for every woman and their birth experience, we never forget it. So, Freya's got carte blanche. She can push me out the way and read her own quotes if she gets up the, the courage or nerve to do it. And if not, she's just here with me because these are her words. So, just to recap, I did a study called Are You Listening to Me? It was a feminist participatory action research study and as always, I like to acknowledge Professors Ruth Deary and Mavis Kirkham for midwifing me through that rather painful process. And this was a study about the interactions between mothers and midwives when labour begins. And the reason I undertook this study, and, and, and Freya was a catalyst, not the only reason, but a catalyst after being with her and her family for two hours, listening to their experience, I came out of her house in 2012 with a risk manager and I said, I cannot do this anymore. I cannot keep saying sorry to women because we've got it wrong. I wanted to understand why we were getting it wrong. So this was a study of the interactions between mothers and midwives when labor begins. So just briefly, the findings from my study indicate that in both birth centers and labor wards, there are barriers to affecting consistent, satisfactory care in terms of emotional as well as physical well-being for both mothers and midwives, situated as midwives are and mothers within outmoded organizational structures. Now, the mantra, you are best to stay at home, emanated from Ball and Washbrook's work, um, Birth Rate Plus, in 1996. And in their very famous book at that time, they talked about X-factor women. They said labour ward was blocked with women, not in labour, and that they took up midwives' time away from women in labour. Women were more likely to have unnecessary medical interventions and increase in caesarean section and instrumental births. In fact, later studies didn't really show that to be the case in terms of caesarean section and instrumental births. So there's a dilemma of the in-labor, not-in-labor discussion. And mothers were coming to see me almost every week or through incident reporting saying they didn't believe me or us. They didn't listen to me or us. They said I wasn't in labor when I knew I was. And they sent me home again, and sometimes again and again. 72 participants took part in this study, and I carried out interviews and focus groups and held a one-day workshop with both midwives and mothers together to look at their own data and to come up with some of their own recommendations. This is really a, a whistle-stop tour of the actual study. And in effect, we have uh, uh, this little diagram where that first interaction when we first meet a woman, and we, we as midwives know that that very first meeting with a mother, even if we've never met her before in her pregnancy, it can make or break an experience for her. And so there's an opportunity to engage in partnership working. So you have the mother and the midwife. She's not in labor. She's not four centimeters. But the mother's saying, I'm in pain. I'm sorry to trouble you, but... And then another midwife might say, well, you'd be ages yet. You don't sound like you're in labor. So another midwife sends the woman home. But the mother's saying, I keep calm for my baby. I don't scream and shout. But if it's like this now, what will it be like then? And then, and I've heard this myself, 
we've just had another BBA. Well, that was quick, came in, gave birth, great. But is it great for the mother when there's this fractured relationship and mothers describe feeling abandonment, rejection and fear? So here's Freya, not long after Grace was born. And the title of this presentation, as you know, is Getting It Right First Time, Holding On and Not Feeling Safe Enough to Let Go. And the implications for women's decision-making. And these are Freya's birth stories. Remember, if you want to say anything, please do. And this was a text that, that, that Freya sent her mum to show that she was doing all the things that she should be doing, even though she was completely exhausted. So the, I'm going to give some background to this case study, Freya's stories, and then we're going to talk about the birth of Ella, the birth of Alice, and then Grace's birth and the consequences and messages from both mothers and midwives. The backdrop to this is the opening of midwifery-led units, birth centres, and then the subsequent suspension of services, suspension of home birth services, the temporary closure of birth centres. And on the day Freya was in labour with her first baby, I was actually the head of midwifery, and I'm so distraught to actually confess this, with a senior doctor, we closed our unit temporarily because there was literally no beds. There weren't enough staff and there was nowhere for any further mothers to go at a point in time in the morning. Meanwhile, I had no idea that somebody like Freya was at home and, and what transpired for her. So Freya had a health, happy, 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 healthy, optimistic pregnancy. Um, there was this temporary maternity unit closure, but Freya had no follow-up call from her midwives to say when or when they might be open again. And she had to keep calling the midwife. She was given no advice on how, how to access the receiving midwifery unit, no offer of an ambulance, and the weather was bad and it was snowing. And Freya said, I was really shocked by it all. So holding on in order not to let go, I was trying to keep really, really calm because I still didn't know what was happening at the hospital. I remember sitting on the sofa and actually thinking, I dare move a lot here in case anything sort of happens. And they kept saying, no, we're still shut, ring later. I was trying not to have a reaction because I was trying to keep calm. But it would have been so easy for me to freak at that point because I didn't have a clue what was happening. Freya described a motorway of thoughts. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't even go to the toilet. I was so worried. You're in a complete, utter state of panic. Every worry and every fear, and if something goes wrong, I felt totally frozen and not daring to move. You don't feel like it's not a relationship. It's not a relationship where you felt at ease to ring and to speak to a midwife. And although Freya's standing here next to me now, and these are her actual words in, 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 from our interview, these were the sentiments expressed by many women when they were sent home told they weren't in labour. So still holding on, Freya said, I was shocked, but it wasn't an issue for them. So eventually, I did get to be seen. We went along to the hospital. I felt really awkward, but I was in pain. Again, not serious pain, but enough to think something is going to be happening soon. And she actually said to me, you're actually in pain now. And it made you feel, shouldn't I be? I didn't feel welcomed. I'd been this woman who'd been on the phone all morning trying to ask, are you open? No. And it just added to me feeling awkward about going in. Anyway, she did an examination and she said, no, nope, you need to go home. And I was a bit unsure about stuff then, but obviously you're a first-timer. I went with exactly what she said, and my turning point was before I even got to the car. And I said, Craig, this is wrong. This is not right, because I was in almighty pain. And holding on, I didn't feel like I was welcome. I felt stupid enough to go back in, because she'd say, oh, you're feeling pain? And I would not have dared, never in a million years. Another midwife, another woman described have, having been told that 
If she'd still had a lipstick on, which she did, she couldn't possibly be in active labour. You've still got your lippy on. So now on a second child, Freya said, I'd have gone straight back. I thought there was no way they were going to take this seriously. But yet I knew this was not right. I knew, I really knew I was in trouble. I remember driving home. I remember crying, having contraction after contraction. And I know that this is upsetting you now, but I know Freya really wants to be here today because she wants us to share this story so that we can get this right for other women. And I remember the whole journey there. I've never, ever felt any pain like it. And I think that's my whole thing. I remember that for later on was the amount of pain, but over such an amount of time and being so uncomfortable. I mean, the back of the car. I remember every acceleration, every slowdown, which was minute but felt so terrible. Eventually, feeling safe enough to let go, the midwife, by the way, was quite surprised by Freya on admission because she'd recently sent her home and was surprised that she looked like, yes, she's in good labour. She filled the pool... But Freya said there was no time to relax. There was nothing that was relaxing about any of it because when it was all sort of rushed in, checked again, and then the birthing pool was full, and I remember running down the corridor and just literally jumping in with my socks on, just trying to relieve some of the almighty pain I was in. Ah, oh, that's superimposed. It wasn't supposed to. I don't know if you can see that on that slide. It shouldn't be doing that. But it did say it took six weeks for the bru- bruising and internal pain to heal. And I can't However, read. it took me. Go on. Psychologically. Yeah, out. yeah, yeah. So reflecting on and holding on, Freya talked afterwards. She said, I did tear, but I grazed all inside. And again, I don't know, and nobody will say. I just know that everybody who's had a child, you know, after a week, they're usually up and about, and I was in absolute pain, and it was like my insides were bruised, really, truly bruised. And whether that was the stress of trying to hold something in, you'll never know. I don't know. However, I think Freya did know. So many months after... Freya said, I was still so shaken up by that. I remember afterwards having these terrible, was like nightmares, but not, and I felt I was contracting again. I could have bet my life I was going again. I remember thinking, oh my God, it's happening again, and absolutely feeling a contraction coming on, which is classic signs of post-traumatic stress. And after my interview with Freya, Freya wanted to know, well, what, happened if, what will happen if I get pregnant again because I just hope it doesn't happen to other people and obviously you know when somebody has been through this how do they then get help when they're going through this again so we're moving on to Alice's birth Freya's second daughter and I was still um, employed in the trust at this time and I made it my business to make sure that she didn't have the same experience next time So although you had your own community midwife, your name midwife, I was still there in the background providing support and help wherever it was needed. So Freya had a high degree of continuity. And from from Gina's presentation this morning, we just know, and we know we've got so much evidence that that relationship and that continuous support makes a difference. Freya chose to give birth on the labour ward and not the birth centre. She wanted an option of an epidural, and her concern at that time was that almighty pain. Freya had lost confidence in us, in herself, and her ability, and yet the stats say that Freya Lockwood had a normal birth. And many of our stats say women have had a normal birth, and they come back to us and say, well, it didn't feel very normal to me. So, feeling safe enough to let go. When Freya called me to say she thought something was happening, I was actually driving home and lived two hours away from where she lives. So I stopped the car and turned it around and drove back. Remember that, don't we? I trusted her judgment. And after I met Freya at the labour ward door, I had prepared a room for her, she came in, and the birth was born, the baby was born within an hour. Not so different from the last birth, if you just look at timings. 
And if you look at when Freya decided to come into the unit, but importantly, Freya decided when to come into the unit. And importantly, she had somebody there who knew that, and she could trust. Interestingly, do you remember that after baby was born and you had your bath? Yeah. You know how women have a bath, if they're lucky enough to have a bath in their, in their, in their birthing room? And we were very lucky where, where our babies were born in our unit. And she was in the bath, and most women are telling you how fantastic or how great they feel because of the birth. But not Freya. All she kept saying was, you believe me. I can't believe you believed me. And it really shocked, really shocked me that that was what was causing your elation, yeah, yeah. that somebody actually believed her. She had no interventions, no epidural, happy postnatally. You always said you were happy. And she was the most settled of your babies. Is that coincidence? I don't believe it's coincidence. Positive birth experience. Personally, I felt a sense of atonement because of what had happened with her first birth. So that's a selfish thing. But I hoped that there would be healing. I don't know if there was healing at that time. Now we come to Grace's birth. Grace is, how old is Grace now? One and a half. She's one and a half. Freya's pregnancy was straightforward. She stayed in touch with me. I no longer worked for the trust, but she stayed in touch with me via telephone. But as term approached, Freya texted me. Really crap night. Couldn't sleep at all, very anxious and upset, just horrible. Got myself in such a state, not good for anyone. So scared, it's torture for me. I've spoken to the midwife this morning, I want to go straight onto Labour Ward. She's written it on my plan, I want to have my options open to be able to get in early. It's all about focused about the uncertainty of when to get in. So hard to be positive, feeling really scared. Ella's birth. Her first birth was still haunting Freya. The fear of the pain of holding on was overwhelming her with anxiety about admission timing. And she said, I'm back in that place again by the fire in almighty pain and mum calling the hospital and they don't want me to go in. It's like I'm back in that place. So we had a long conversation about, well, what are your options here, Freya? Because her pregnancy was progressing fine. You were near your due date, weren't you? And we had some very long and convoluted conversations about your decisions and your choices. I said, give birth at home, Freya. That eliminates the problem almost immediately. If you stay at home, then you don't need to worry about when to go in, because that was a big thing for you, wasn't it? But you didn't, didn't, didn't feel that you could do that. Such is the fear imposed on so many women that they're too frightened to go for home birth, even though we know it's a safe option for women. I'd said, if you await spontaneous labour, that's your best chance of a normal birth. But that wasn't really cutting any ice no, with you. I did that either, did I? <laughs> so I went on call to provide support, although living two hours away, I could not guarantee I would be there at the birth. We talked about induction of labour, and I mm. did think, as did her mother and her community midwife, that actually Freya had a good indication, a really valid indication, due to severe anxiety, anxiety resulting from her first birth experience. Yes, yeah, she could have a time in the epidural, if that's what she wanted, that's her decision. And we even talked about elective caesarean, which you were very clear that you didn't, yeah, didn't want, know. did you? And lots of things like the weather and the snow became a factor in your decision-making, which maybe people don't always realise. The home circumstances affect what kinds of choices and decisions mothers make. And it was... The forecast for the following week was really bad, wasn't it? Yeah. It was. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Right. So Freya opted for induction of labour because this would give her some certainty. She knew then she could be in the right place at the right time and she could have a planned epidural. But this was the birth of Grace. I say, but this was the birth of Grace. I say it with some kind of sadness in my voice and I actually 
That, that's me being open and honest here. But actually, that wasn't how you felt no. at all, was it? No. I was really pleased. I felt like I'd just had the first birth where I was looked after. I had Helen, I had other great midwives in there from the start. I was just felt like I was looked after. So for me, it was a good birth, wasn't it? Yeah. But it wasn't how it should have been. But compared to my first experience, it was a really good birth. Yeah, me. yeah. Freya was happy, despite near collapse, her blood pressure fell. Uh, it was dealt with, but she did feel half awful after the epidural was sighted. Mm. After the first examination and ruptured membranes, there was suspected cord prolapse. But in fact, she had an emergency caesarean section for a compound presentation. It wasn't rushed to theatre. We hoped the baby would pull its arms, her arm back, but it didn't. The arm just kept coming down. Grace was very unsettled initially, wasn't she? And you had what you described. Yeah. As, as pretty poor postnatal care. At five weeks, Freya was on antibiotics for a wound infection. Okay, thank you, Sue. And you eventually, you tried so hard, but breastfeeding just didn't work for you both. And baby was eventually, eventually diagnosed with a tongue tie. That wasn't diagnosed till four weeks. So the, from a midwife's perspective, this wasn't great, but you were happy with yeah. your decisions. So there's a price to be paid for not getting it right first time. And you say, Freya, that it's not about cost. No. So what, do you want me to read that? Do you want I to? think actually just things that don't cost, just being talked to well and nicely and to, believe, and to be believed. Could have been, she could have simply said, listen, you know, again, if you want, once I've checked you, you're all right now and it doesn't look like there's any problems. But if you want, why don't you go for it to the canteen and get yourself a cup of tea and just see how you feel. And if you feel all right, go home for a bit. And if you don't come back, it doesn't cost anything. So I think the thing was, if, some, if people had listened to me on first time and just spoken to me nicely, I didn't need to know the hospital was shutting and that was it. You could have just said, I'll ring you back in an hour. Keep yourself calm. It's fine. We'll ring you back and check in on you. But instead, I just got the hospital shut. There's nowhere else. Huddersfield shut as well. You'll have to ring back later. No offer of anything else, whereas if they'd have just kept me calm and just spoken to me nicely, I wouldn't have panicked so much, but it put me into a real freak-out position, which didn't need to happen. It doesn't cost to just speak to people nicely, you know, and understandingly. Thanks, Freya. Just very briefly, because we're running out of time here, this was just a photograph of our one-day workshop where the mothers and the midwives from the study came together to try and seek some solutions. And these were the things that they prioritised. See women at home for assessment, and that helps to raise confidence for mothers. I used to do that early in my career. I don't know why we've stopped doing it. Maybe some of you do still do that, but it needs to be standard. Obviously, we need more midwives, and we cannot stop saying that we need more midwives. And being allowed to stay in when in latent phase, these are the women's words, not my words. And, and, and this, ter this notion of being allowed, why are we either not allowing or allowing, just saying, come, go and have a cup of coffee and come back, is that such a big thing? So the women ask for ongoing contact with whoever takes that first call from them. Some of you might have a hotline with dedicated staff, but I don't think it's universal. And free classes and antenatal education for all. Oh, God, I'm going to have to whistle through this. And stop not involving women in decision-making and trust in midwives and mothers' intuition. And st stop saying you're only two centimetres. If a woman says she's in labour, she's in labour, whichever phase we decide to call it. And stop communicating irrelevant information causing anxiety, like being told the birth centre was closed or the hospital was closed. So getting it right first time, nearly finished Sue, the midwife just couldn't quite believe what had happened. And again, you feel like saying... If you'd have listened in the first place, I wouldn't have been so scared that I opted for interventions that have resulted in an awful time till now, but, uh, till but, was, now, but was still the right decision for me because of what happened with Ella. You can read that, don't you? 
later, long time later, I was talking to, to, to Freya, and she said, the importance of a greeting for a mother, you can't uh, underestimate how important that is. And, and you had to take Grace to the children, yeah. the local children's ward, because she wasn't well and she had a, a rash, and you were frantic and upset, and in another vulnerable state, just like you felt yeah. like you were going back into yeah. hospital again. And you said, I needed reassurance, just like in labour, and I was panicking. And when I walked in, they said, come on in. Oh, and they took me straight to a room, and they offered me tea and toast. And my shoulders immediately relaxed, and immediately I felt safe, and I was believed. My gosh, it's so simple, isn't it? And yet sometimes we find it the hardest thing to do, but it's so simple, and yet so profound. So thank you for listening to us today. Uh, thank you from Ella and Alice and young Grace and from Frey and me. Thank you very much. Thank you.